Today I'm here to talk to you about various laboratory tests for rabies diagnosis. Can everybody hear me in the back or do I need to increase the volume before I start? Okay, I guess we're, we're good to go then. Okay. A little louder? Okay. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay. So rabies is the only major disease in which laboratory diagnosis in an animal directly affects human treatment. Prompt and reliable laboratory diagnosis um, in animals is essential to post-exposure prophylaxis in humans. And from Dr. Franco's talk, you know that early diagnosis of rabies in humans is essential for patient treatment decisions, implementation of infection control measures, and evaluation of patient contacts for post-exposure prophylaxis, and determination of the potential virus source for epidemiologic investigation. Now, in my talk, we're going to review the types of test methods, test for anti-mortem diagnosis of humans. We'll discuss the samples, the applications of the test methods, and the interpretations of the results. We'll spend some time talking briefly about postmortem laboratory diagnosis, the best samples for postmortem diagnosis, the application of these test methods, and interpretation of the results. It's important, again, although Dr. Franco mentioned this, to review how we uh, test for these agents in regards to the actual rabies virus. When we look at the rabies virus structure, there are two proteins that we routinely test for. We detect nucleoprotein when we look for rabies virus antigen, when we test for postmortem brain, uh, when we test for antigen and postmortem brain tissues. As Dr. Franca mentioned, the glycoprotein is the protein of choice in looking at pathogenesis of the disease and um, in looking at viral virulence. But this particular protein is more important in a diagnostic issue in regards to the, uh, the detection of antibodies for neutralizing antibodies, the detection of neutralizing antibodies. So before we go on and look at anti-mortem tests, we'll look at some direct test methods that are more or less rapid tests. And some of these methods may be used to detect histopathologic changes, to detect rabies virus antigen, or observe the rabies virus virion itself. And this is done without any amplification. What do we mean by amplification? We mean performing virus isolation or doing RT-PCR. These are two methods that we can use in a laboratory to increase the, the, our ability to detect virus in samples that are not highly, um, in, highly infected or that may have high amounts of rabies virus antigen. So if we look at direct detection methods, these are, for instance, with histopathological changes, this would mean, these would be uh, H and E slides. And I see here that not all of my, um, my uh, figures are showing up on this particular slide. Because what I should have been showing is, here you're detecting just some histopathologic uh, changes. So I'm seeing perivascular cupping around that. Oh, thank you, Jesse. I didn't realize I had animation. <laughs> oh, whatever. OK, so I've got perivascular cupping, some of the signs of um, histopathologic <coughs> changes you may see in an H&E stain. I'm looking at, um, with this arrow here, 
I'm looking at a inclusion here. Well, I can't. The second slide in the center, we see an arrow at a viral inclusion, an intracytoplasmic inclusion. Is this typical of rabies? Yes. Does this tell me this is a rabbit sample from, from a, a sample from a rabbit patient? No. All I know is that these are things that are consistent with an encephalitis due to rabies, but is it specific for rabies? No. Thank you. <clears throat> so these are changes that I might see if I were looking at it with routine histopathology. In some laboratories, particularly in developing countries, they're still using histopathologic um, methods in order to diagnose rabies. Sometimes this is by using specialized stains such as cellars. These are non-specific tests. These are not telling us that this is a rabies case. This is very highly suggestive, but it is not specific for rabies virus. In this particular case here, another detection method that's not widely used, but is available these days, is to look at ultrastructure. When would we do this, not routinely in diagnosing a case, but perhaps in some kinds of research applications, or perhaps in some cases to follow up on an unusual, um, <coughs> an unusual discovery of a, of a new variant in a patient. One may want to look at the ultrastructure to see if this in fact looks like a rabies virus or a non-rabies lysovirus. So observations by electron microscopy, again, we are looking, we can tell this is a rhabdovirus, and we do know that this is a rabies virus, but we could tell by the structure of the rhabdovirus whether it is a rabies virus or another rhabdo. But it's too costly to use for routine diagnosis. So what do we use for routine diagnosis? Well, for post-mortem diagnosis of rabies, in animals and humans. The gold standard test for rabies diagnosis is the direct fluorescent antibody test. In the US, we have a standard protocol which has specialized, we have requirements for the tissues tested, how they're tested, and how they're recorded. And we, we focus our attention on the hindbrain tissues. So the most important tissues for performing this test are to look at a full cross-section of brainstem and the three lobes of the cerebellum, the vermis, the right, and the left lateral lobes. Why is this important is because of Dr. Franca's lecture, and we, we understand that for the virus to go from the site of infection, it must travel through nerve tracts ascending to the brain. By taking a complete cross-section of the brain stem from an animal or a human which has died from rabies, we can test the maximum ascending and descending nerve tracts. Now here, this is a direct test, and when we look at the viral inclusions that are detected with fluorescent labeled antibodies, what we are actually seeing is the RNP of the rabies virus, that core of the virus, the nucleoprotein that we saw before. And there are many, many copies that make up one inclusion. Another test we can use for rabies diagnosis, which is a more recent test, which is another rabies-specific procedure is the DRIT. The DRIT is the Direct Immunohistochemistry Test. Using the DRIT, we use biotinylated antibodies that react specifically with rabies virus antigen. They form an antigen antibody complex, and we develop the color that, we develop the color, 
by using a chemical method using strep abatin biotin. This will again detect specific rabies virus inclusions that are intracellular. And this, we discussed this in detail, but this outline describes the procedures that are routinely used for histopathologic examination using nonspecific stellar stains. The rabies virus antigen detects the DFA and the DREP. We talked about amplification methods, and one of the classic methods for amplification of rabies virus was by cell culture and mouse inoculation. When we think about virus isolation in the laboratory, these days we're more interested in using in vitro methods. In vitro methods are as sensitive as using animal models, and we prefer not to use animals when we don't need to. So, cells can be inoculated and grown either in cell culture flasks or on slides to isolate virus. And how does this happen? We take neuroblastoma cells that have been harvested, we add suspensions of brain or other fluids we're testing from the patient, we incubate them and put them on slides to incubate for days. Within one to two days, we, in some cases, can detect inclusions inside of the cells. And then they'll be passaged in three to five days if these are negative and we want to do at least two blind passages. So let's look at a broad picture of, of all tests. Well, if we look at beyond the direct tests and beyond the classic tests, what tests are available these days, particularly for anti-mortem and post-mortem testing, we can use serology. We can look for antibodies that are antibodies to the viral nucleoproteins inside of the cells, and we can look for specific IgG and IgM antibodies. We can look for viral neutralizing antibodies. We can look, as we just mentioned, for antigen. And we can look by virus isolation. And we can use molecular methods, RT, PCR, and sequencing. What samples do we need to do antemortem testing? And which are the best samples? There are four samples that are most useful in making a rabies diagnosis. They are the skin biopsy, the CSF, and the serum. Brain biopsies and corneal impressions can be useful in making a rabies diagnosis. But do we routinely get these? No. Why? Because these are more invasive than the other samples. If we happen to have a brain biopsy, which was collected for herpes virus uh, isolation, or PCR, or there are corneal impressions which have already been taken, then we can test them for rabies diagnosis. But corneal impressions are difficult to read, and the potential damage to the patient uh, can be great if the, if the um, samples are collected appropriately. So we prefer not to take these samples. In most of the cases in the U.S., in fact, all of them, when these samples have been available, have been diagnosed. And so what tests do we perform on these samples? Well, the skin biopsy, we perform two tests. We use a direct test in which we can have an answer within two hours of receipt of the sample, and that is the DFA test. What other samples can we perform on the skin? we can use nested PCR. On saliva, we mentioned saliva as a possible source. Saliva can be tested by nested PCR. Saliva can be tested by isolation, but for diagnosis and a rapid turnaround, we need a quicker test. Nested PCR 
will still take a minimum of 24 to 48 hours. But it is one of our best tests for rabies diagnosis in anti-mortem samples. So this is a very important test. The CSF can be used as a sample for testing by IFA to detect IgM and IgG antibodies, or by the rapid fluorescent focus inhibition test for viral neutralizing antibodies. We'll talk about the CSF and serum together in relation to these tests. The serum can also be tested again by IFA for IgM and IgG and by the RIFID for viral neutralizing antibodies. Why do we run or need two tests on these samples? Well, if we look at the results again, because we want to get as rapid an answer as we can and have a complete answer, the IFA is a highly sensitive test. Why? Because we are going to be detecting antibodies to those nucleoproteins that we saw in the slides earlier. We should be able to see IFA antibodies sometimes before we actually see viral neutralizing antibodies to the glycoprotein. We have more N protein in infected cells than we usually see in, um, in infected cells. Okay, the CSF is, is important. Why would we say, why would we need a CSF sample when we have a serum? The CSF is an important sample in rabies diagnosis because although we see serum antibodies in all of us that have been immunized against rabies, we do not normally have antibodies in our CSF to rabies, even if we have received rabies virus vaccine. So having antibodies in the CSF that are either IFA antibodies, those are to the nucleoprotein, or virus neutralizing antibodies, it will be highly diagnostic if these antibodies are present in the CSF. Let's talk about collection of the sample, the nuchal biopsy. So a nuchal biopsy is usually taken from the hair, just below the hairline, it's a five to six millimeter full punch biopsy of the skin. How do we handle that in the laboratory? Well, we want again to get the most rapid answer as possible. So we do one test that we'll have a quick answer on, and we'll do one test that will take a little bit longer with an answer within, say, 24 hours to 48 in some cases where there needs confirmation. The first test will be the DFA, and the second test will be the RT-PCR. But how will this sample be handled so that we will not have cross-contamination in the laboratory? The first sample, the RT-PCR portion, will be collected first by the molecular biologist in the area where RNA will be extracted. And that piece of tissue that we're going to use for the RT-PCR will be the subcutaneous adipose tissue which would normally be removed or would have to be removed in order to do routine cryosections in the laboratory. So that piece of adipose tissue will be removed and if we look at that lower portion of adipose tissue what we can see just in this full section of skin is that we will actually see nerves that go from the, um, from the hair follicle out into the adipose tissue. And so that is a very good source for RT-PCR and doesn't interfere with our routine sample for cryosections. That will be uh, minced and RT-PCR will be performed on it. That upper portion, the dermis, um, well, within below the cornified layer to the um, to the line, the dermis. That dermis will then be sectioned in the cryostat, and we'll look for rabies virus antigen at the base of the hair follicle. And when we do this, we'll be looking 
at this, this again is a DFA test. We're using the DFA and we're looking for specific rabies virus antigen and this is a sagittal section of a hair follicle and we'll actually have half of the hair follicle in a sagittal section and half the cross section in the in OCT material. You look at the cross section again you see rabies virus antigen and this is um, rabies virus nucleoprotein in the base of the hair follicle by frozen sections and here again we have another frozen section and here is another um, sagittal section. If we look at the indirect fluorescent antibody test for rabies virus antibodies, this is another of the quick tests. How do we do this in the lab? Probably if you're a physician or veterinarian, it's not really important to you whether or not um, you understand these particular steps. But it is important to realize that this is a more rapid test and we will be able to detect whether we have IgG or IgM antibody. So how do we do it in the lab? We have CVS, we have rabies virus infected cells. We add an an a patient's dilutions of antibodies. We allow that to react and we add to it labeled fluorescent antibodies that are anti-human. And by doing that, we can look for both early and later antibodies. We can look for IgG and IgM antibodies. And we would expect that in an active infection that we would see both IgM and IgG antibodies. And when we look at these, um, these tests under a fluorescent microscope and we look at the infected cells that have been incubated with a patient's antibodies, if a patient has antibodies, it will look like the routine DFA test. We will see those antibodies are to the nucleoprotein, so we're going to see infected cells fluoresce. And if the patient doesn't have antibodies, the test will be negative. If we look at the fluorescent focus um, inhibition test, this is a neutralizing antibody test. So how do we do this? And what are we doing when we do the test? When we do this test, we're seeing if this patient has antibodies that will inhibit the isolation of virus in cells. We incubate diluted patient serum. We add cells. We incubate it overnight. Those slides are fixed those slides have DFAs on them and if the patient in this case has neutralizing antibodies to rabies virus we won't have infected cells. The patient's antibodies when incubated with the rabies virus, a known challenge dose, will inhibit that virus from infecting the cells and therefore we would get a negative result. On the other hand, if the patient doesn't have antibodies, then we would expect to see infected cells. Why? Because when we mix the patient's antibodies with the patient's serum, with, with virus, rabies virus of a known challenge dose, and add cells, those cells are not inhibited because there are no antibodies and we would see fluorescent cells. When is this test important? Because we could say we've got an IFA. Well, sometimes patients have positive IFAs and negative neutralizing antibodies. And that is more the case than having a patient have neutralizing antibodies and not antibodies to nucleoprotein. This test is an important test, particularly if you're monitoring a human rabies case. So this would be very important to be able to monitor to see that a patient 
is developing antibodies in the serum and the CSF. Another of the more important tests are for antemortem are the RT-PCR. What kind of samples can we test by RT-PCR? We can test saliva, skin, corneal impressions, and any fluids that might contain rabies virus um, within them. And what we're looking for in this particular case is the presence of RNA. But in many cases, RNA can be limited in these samples. And so it'll require um, nested or hemi-nested RT-PCR in order to amplify them. We talked about the skin biopsy previously, and this shows what we might see in PCR perform them on both skin and saliva samples. We talked about isolation. Well, isolation, as we said, in antemortem doesn't have that sensitivity. It lacks the sensitivity that RT-PCR has and requires days to weeks to confirm or rule out a rabies diagnosis. So classic methods such as this wouldn't be useful in making a rabies diagnosis. If we look at the results we've had in looking at antemortem samples, you can see that <coughs> saliva isolation is not as good as RT-PCR. Serum and CSF antibodies are quite good in making an early diagnosis and the skin DFA. In this particular um, particular chart, um, it doesn't, doesn't demonstrate it quite as well um, because we've had a number of survivors recently in which we have not been able to detect um, RT-PCR positive results from saliva. But of our antemortem tests, in general, saliva and uh, serum and C and serum and DFA tend to be our best um, results. Okay, in conclusion, um, the rabies virus nucleoprotein, the RNP, is the target of most antigen detection tests. And of course, as we said and will say many times, the standard test for rabies diagnosis is the DFA, particularly on brain <laughs> tissues. Um, as Richard said, the glycoprotein is important in interaction with um, host cell receptors and cycle infection, and these neutralizing antibodies um, target the G protein. Um, Antemortem tests are essential for patient treatment decisions, implementation of infection controls, evaluation of patient contacts and exposures. And of the um, antemortem tests that are possible, there are four that are um, our usual and the most important to perform, and they are the serum, the CSF, the serum, and, and uh, skin samples. Um, RT-PCR, um, when optimal, uh, is able to produce an amplicon. When virus loads are as uh, little as one infectious unit in, um, in primary PCR, and by using a hemi-nested or nested PCR, we can increase this to um, 10 to 100 folds, which, which makes it one of our best techniques for antemortem tests. The standard protocol for postmortem diagnosis in animals, again, is the DFA. And this, pro this procedure includes requirements for sampling of the tissues and procedures that are part of our national protocol. But the sampling, the important thing is to test the maximum ascending and descending nerve tracts, we must test a full cross-section of brainstem, and that's the tissue most likely to be found positive. And the DRIT has, is an excellent test for rabies surveillance and confirmatory testing, and probably will be another future test to be used on human postmortem um, diagnosis. Thank you to all um, people who have contributed to this uh, presentation, and I have a number of references, both websites and, um, and in the literature for your um, review at your convenience. Thank you very much for... Um, <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Horsieri. Are there any questions? The floor is now open for questions. Yes. I appreciate the importance of these anti-mortem 
uh, tests for, uh, for treatment for infection control, for PCP prophylaxis, and for the virus source of epi investigation. My question is, coming in as epidemiologist, yeah. have you evaluated the surveillance system in terms of its sensitivity and its positive predictive value to be a service to the hospital that requires it? I mean, how many, what percentage of the times can you tell the hospital that this is exactly rabies or it's not rabies, or if the samples of the hair or the skin biopsy don't come in clear, it's indeterminate. How, how often do you get the right diagnosis uh, and can give the hospital the service that they need? Actually, with performing these four tests, if all four samples are available, we can provide a rabies diagnosis 100% of the time. 100% of the rabies cases have been diagnosed using these four samples. However, all four samples must be available because there are no cases in which, there are some cases, and there are many cases when all four samples are positive, but not always. And so it's important because depending on the stage of disease, as Dr. Franco mentioned, some of these samples may or may not be positive. So what happens when, when you don't get all four and you get only two? Depending upon the situation, oh, depending upon the situation, if, if we only get two, then we really need to request the others if the tests are negative. Rabies cannot be ruled out only with a serum sample we will need a serum and a CSF. Or we can't rely on just the skin because we know that depending upon the levels of neutralizing antibodies, we may or may not be able to detect a positive saliva or a positive skin. So In for fact, example, if you had an animal case and did not have a brain stem, did you make a definitive diagnosis if all you had were negative other sample brain areas without the brain stem? No, of course not. Rabies so cannot example, be ruled out. So, for example, we have brain stems that have been negative before. No. Brain stems. Brain I'm stems. I'm sorry. Uh, skin biopsies that have been negative in a human patient. Before. Of course. And, yes. And sometimes, why would that be in a rabies patient? In a rabies patient, particularly because we have neutralizing antibodies present. Or suppose the sample itself. Oh, of course. Then the sample also has to be. A correct sample. We need sufficient hair follicles to be able to detect rabies virus. We need a minimum of, say, four or five hair follicles to be sure, so that we can sample them correctly. So sampling is important, whether it's the brain or whether it's um or whether it's a, a skin. And if you collected a CSF, the CSF won't be valuable if there's blood in the sample. Why? Because you've contaminated that with blood. Yes? What is the status of the animal anti-mortem anti testing? Uh, well, from my previous this talk... Course, Sarah, can you repeat the question? Oh. Because those in the webinar cannot oh, hear the I audience. apologize. No, that's fine. I just received a question on the progress of anti-mortem tests on animals. Okay. As Dr. Franca mentioned earlier, animals and humans can secrete virus in saliva intermittently. And we all have seen this. So if in time you take a single sample from an animal, there's no way to really rule out rabies. Besides that, the rapid tests that are currently available for rabies diagnosis, particularly the ones that are currently being marketed, which are lateral flow or linear flow assays, do not have the sensitivity and specificity required to make a rabies diagnosis. Some tests have high rates of false positives, and some have high rates of, um, of false negatives. Neither case would be um, would be um, would be optimal. Is there anything else? Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, thank you. Is there um, if you have a patient that you are you cannot control samples 
and um, you don't really have a positive in any of the ones that you have so far, and you decide to start treatment, would that something? Would that be something that you would do if you do not have all the tests uh, positive and you have the suspicion? Um, if you start treatment uh, on that person, will that affect any further testing that you uh, end up doing? Well, first of all, are you talking about treatment as using antivirals to treat, or are you talking about prophylaxis? Either way. Okay. Um, you wouldn't give prophylaxis to a, a, a rabies patient showing signs. We know that that in many cases they've been there are documented rapid deaths following prophylaxis in a patient already showing signs of rabies. So that that would be contraindicated if if rabies was in the differential diagnosis. However, when you're going to intubate a patient, and this patient may already be intubated in that particular case, but when you're going to induce a coma and give antivirals and, a, and, a, and an experimental procedure, you need to have a positive rabies test result before proceeding rabies treatment. So you should not, I mean, unless you have a positive, you should never start with that type of uh, treatment, if you have, even if you have a high suspicion of uh, exposure? I mean, it, it, depending upon the situation. If the patient was bitten by a dog where rabies is endemic, the patient did not receive PEP and showing clinical signs of rabies, that probably would, that's sufficient to treat. That would be treating on, but you're treating on clinical signs, and so that is a um, that is at least confirmation in a way. But I would still expect some tests to be positive. Yeah, but generally those results are available in a few hours. Yes. So when we receive samples in four hours, we already have CSF, skin biopsy tests, and zero. And there is only PCR we have to do very long because yes. there are multiple steps. So generally between six to seven, eight hours we already know once we receive samples. There, there's no reason if you expect rabies that you should not concomitantly be collecting samples at the time you're concomitantly experimentally treating a human being. And you probably already have samples in the fridge and the freezer because you've been testing for other things for like West Nile virus anyway. or other encephalitis. So you would already have some samples available. This is not a cavalier episode. You've owned this patient for weeks for experimental treatment, 24-7. It's not your resident is going off on the weekend. You own this patient for four to six weeks. It would and be ludicrous not to do testing anymortem to confirm rabies in a suspicious patient that you're putting time, talent, and treasure in experimentally for a month not the 21st century. Well, let me follow up on that, because as far as I know, and you can correct me, uh, treatment for humans has been unsuccessful for many, many years. And, and people who get rabies do not live, or have many few, a few patients have survived once they get rabies with the treatment that we try to give them. Correct. So what would be the serological test, or what would be the evidence that this patient has conquered the disease? Um, and we just talked about that because that's an excellent, that's an excellent question. Can you repeat the question? Oh, okay. The question was, okay. The question was, because we've had so few successes in human rabies treatment, what would be the test? that would be the indicator that we're likely to have a successful patient treatment situation. And when you put them into rehab. Oh, okay, and when we would put them into rehab. And we discussed this earlier in the utility of running the rapid focus inhibition test for viral neutralizing antibodies. What we would want to see is the high titers of not 
viral neutralizing antibodies, but not only in the serum, we want to see CSF antibodies because virus will not be cleared from the CNS until we see evidence of antibodies in the CSF. What about As saliva? A, what I, just, I was just Come ready on, to, crank well, it up. <laughs> I was just ready to say that. Concomitantly with the CSF and serum neutralizing antibodies, we're testing on a daily basis for following these cases saliva samples. And what we would expect to see, even as we're watching with a highly sensitive test, we would expect to see decrease in viral nucleic acid, and we would expect to go down to below detectable limits. And we would expect to see that at the same time as we're seeing a rise in neutralizing antibodies, we should see a decrease in the load of nucleic acid by RT-PCR in the, in the saliva. And on a patient that's going to recover, we should see it go down so that we cannot detect anything. And we have seen this happen in patients who have recovered from rabies. Yes? Yeah, Lillian, uh, from our online audience, there's a question from Juan Matano from Mexico. Uh -huh. and his question is, has the rabies virus ever been isolated from any of the rabies survivors? Good question uh, from Juan, Trick from Dr. Question. <laughs> Dr. Um, question. The question is, thank you. Um, the question is a good one. <laughs> have, we, <laughs> have we on rabies survivors? The first, the actual first patient in which we could not obtain an RT-PCR positive on saliva was the first of our rabies survivors after treatment. And we were never able to get an amplicon from saliva, nor were we able to get um, a virus isolated. And, and that's, that's the reason why, in these cases, we also need to have the, sero the serologic tests and the antigen detection tests because we cannot just rely on isolation for even a more sensitive test like RT-PCR. What about Columbia? What about Columbia? Going back to the question. Have oh, we ever yes, yes. Yes, and you can have isolation because these patients are um, are secreting virus in some cases. And yes, you could have virus isolation positive, and you could then clear virus from saliva. So yes. So Lillian, do you think that that phenomenon is a result of the fact that you don't consistently or that you intermittently um, secrete the virus in saliva, or does initiation of treatment have anything to do um, with that? No, initiation of treatment does have something to do with it, because not only is the, parent, the patient allowed to produce its own <coughs> antibodies, but there's the patient's been given antivirals and it's allowed their immune system to produce um, neutralizing antibodies against rabies virus. But in the case of the first example, the patient had high titers of neutralizing antibodies within the first samples. Without a history of vaccination. Without a history of vaccination, correct. Thank you. Lillian, our next question oh. is, how do you how do you do RT-PCR with a corneal impression? Oh, how can you do RT-PCR in a corneal impression? Well, RT-PCR is a very sensitive technique. And so if the samples had been handled appropriately in your laboratory, that means the corneal impression slide is not touched anywhere in the processing area where rabies might be handled. That means clean gloves. It means it goes into a clean molecular area where RNA is extracted. Then one can take a lysis buffer and put it onto the slide and carefully with a applicator stick or a pipette scrape from the um, from the slide the cells suspend that and add that 
to a triacyl reagent and do a routine, um, a routine RNA extraction. Have we ever done this with um, with other slides? Yes. You can you can even do this with a brain impression on occasion if you um, if it's your only sample. But again, that sample, that slide, has to have been handled in a very clean area which has not seen rabies virus or nucleic acid. Thank you. We have one, one more question, and the question is, thank, well, thank you for the presentation. This question is whether or not rabies virus can get excreted in, in the saliva of a rabbit horse or a donkey, and are these animals dead-end hosts, if you can talk about that. Well, yes, rabies virus can be secreted in the saliva of any mammal, um, and yes, it can. Are these dead-end hosts? Well, yes, we have no, I mean, well, yeah, it does depend. We don't have reservoirs of horse rabies and, and donkey rabies. However, they could perhaps pass on the disease because we have secreted infectious virus. If a patient, a human, or an animal were bitten or had mucous membrane exposure to infectious virus, then those animals or humans could become infected with rabies virus. And there has been transmission to humans. Right, and there has been transmission from these animals to humans. But do we have reservoirs of these uh, of the disease in these um, in these animals? No. Not today. At least, yeah, at least not today. Thank you. Thank you for your help, also, <laughs> Dr. Rupert. <laughs> Really, not, I don't want to question sure. since we are really in time. From your presentation, it is clear that it is important to select appropriate methods for right. appropriate tissues. Correct. And from some publication or presentation past week, there are, there are cases where people are using, for example, DFA, test CSF, oh, or wow. DFA use of coronary infections, yeah. or PCR used for uh, CSF virus detection. So, what, what is your experience in hoping? Okay, yes. Okay, the question from, Rick, from Dr. Franca was that, um, that this week at Rita, we heard about people using PCR, for instance, on unusual samples, and we have heard of people doing DFA on other unusual samples, um, such as saliva, such as CSF. Well, what we want to do is run the correct test that has the optimal sensitivity for the particular sample. So, for brain tissue, the most sensitive and specific test that would give the most rapid answer would be the direct fluorescent antibody test. And that is with the correct tissues. So the correct tissues for the direct fluorescent antibody test on postmortem brain would be postmortem brain tissues, and it would be a cross section of the brain stem. And then the next most likely tissue to be positive would then be the cerebellum. We would not expect to see rabies virus in the cerebral cortex or in the hippocampi before seeing it in the brain stem and the cerebellum. Okay. Would I perform a DFA on CSF? No. Why? Because I don't expect to see rabies virus antigen in CSF. Is there a possibility that by centrifuging cells, I, I might be able to centrifuge them and look for um, rabies virus antigen by, um, by DFA? Yes. And have but you found CSFs positive? Yes. Very rare situation. Yes, and CSFs have been positive rarely by both RT PCR and DFA and virus isolation. But in most of these cases, it was after breakdown of the blood brain barrier when brain cells themselves have reached into the CSF. So the CSF normally is not positive by these methods. And the CSF is a better sample 
for rabies virus neutralizing or other IgM and IgG antibodies. Okay, um, another question was saliva. Well, if I had a saliva, what I would do is I would test it by RT-PCR. If I didn't have the possibility to test it by RT-PCR, I would use isolation in cell culture or mice. Why? Because there's going to be very little virus or very little nucleic acid in a saliva sample. Therefore, in order to amplify the sample, the, the, the amplify the load of either virus or nucleic acid in the sample, I need to use a method such as isolation or RT-PCR. So choosing the right sample for the test is most important. Similarly, would I take a skin sample from, um, from a hand of a patient um, just because the patient was bitten on the hand? No, I want to get the maximum number of hair follicles, so I would look for the hairline.